good morning and welcome everybody to this uh, valedictory function of the orientation come selection camp of the physics olympiad uh, this is the first session of this function where we traditionally have a lecture and we are very pleased today to have uh, with us professor shiraz minwala a senior professor at the tata institute of fundamental research and uh, it should not be too much to say that one of the uh, most well known theoretical physicists of, of the country and internationally also. So I will give a, a more formal introduction of uh, Shiraz later. Uh, right now, uh, I'd invite him to give his talk on black holes. Shiraz. Uh, thanks a lot, Tanvi. And um, thanks for the invitation to come and speak here. Um, OK, so let's, let's start. Um, so um, it, does this work? Can you hear me from here? Excellent. OK, so my talk today is it's titled Black Holes and is meant to introduce you to fascinating objects that we now know almost for sure exist in our, in our universe uh, and are fascinating for various reasons. I want to tell you about them and why they exist. OK, so the story starts about 100 years ago, a little more than 100 years ago with Einstein. Um, who put forward a new theory um, called the general theory of relativity. Einstein, about 100 years ago, was trying, uh, was trying to reconcile two known theories of physics, the special theory of relativity, a framework in which physics was supposed to be uh, based, and uh, Newton's theory of gravity. And uh, the, the theory he finally came up with to achieve this reconciliation uh, was a marvelous theory. Okay? What, what he tried, what, 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 he, uh, what he postulated and since been experimentally verified in a number of ways um, is that gravity is a consequence of a remarkable fact, uh, of the following fact that the geometry of space and time in our universe is not static but dynamical. Okay? Now what, well, um, let me say a little more and then I'll try to explain. Um, the idea is that space and time are not some unmoving stage on which dynamics happen. Space and time are participants in the dynamics of the universe. And the way they participate is that the geometry of space and time warp, bend, react to dynamics, and in turn affect dynamics. OK. So um, this, this, uh, this allows, you know, in the process of dynamics, all kinds of things can happen. For instance, all of space and time can expand and is expanding in the universe as we speak. Um, rip, the ripples of space and time exist. They're called gravitons. And wonderful things happen. OK. Now, I tried to explain to you, I, I tried, well, I mentioned that uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity was an attempt to make a relativistic version of Newton's laws of gravity. And so uh, uh, um, the minimal thing that it does is in appropriate regimes, that is when masses are not too large and when velocities are not too high, it reduces to Newton's laws of gravity. You know, that's, that's, that's what it set out to do. And it, did, it did that. However, you know, it's a hallmark of really great, of really fundamental advances in physics that they achieve more than they set out to do. So Einstein set out to try to reconcile special relativity and, and uh, gravity, and then he found a theory that had in it much more than a souped up version of Newton's laws of gravity. He, had a, he found a theory that predicted entirely new phenomena, um, entirely new phenomena that Newton's laws of gravity were just, in, uh, I mean, could, could not be addressed in, in, in the theory of Newton's theory of gravity. One of these phenomena is the existence of gravitational waves. These ripples of space time that, 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 that um, uh, that, that, that give rise to wave-like excitations, very much like ripples of the electromagnetic field give rise to light, is a completely new prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity. There's no, no analog of these gravitons um, or gravitational waves in Newton's theory of gravity. Um, another thing that his theory took from, you know, allowed us to take, uh, another thing that his theory did is allow us to study the dynamics of the universe as a whole, how the universe as a whole can expand, contract, and took the th the question of cosmology, the, the study of the beginning of the universe and its, its evolution history since it began from the realm of religion and 
speculation into science. Okay? But I'm gonna, my talk is neither about gravitational waves nor about cosmology, both of, which, both of which could be fascinating subjects for his talk. My talk is about a new, uh, a third new phenomenon that Einstein's uh, uh, theory of general relativity predicted, um, which again has no analog in Newton's theory. And uh, this, this new phenomenon was the, uh, was the existence of a new class of, new class of objects um, called black holes. This is what I'm going, going to tell you about. Only a few months after, you know, Einstein famously is reported to have said, soon after publishing his equations of general relativity, that his equations are so complicated that human beings will never find exact solutions to these equations. You know, people who invent theories are often not the best uh, at, at understanding them and uh, or predicting how they will be used, and Einstein was wrong about this. A few months after he published his equations, um, this chap called Schwarzschild discovered the first and first exact solution to Einstein's equations, apart from the trivial solution, the flat plane. Um, now, uh, the, this solution is very interesting. So I told you that Einstein's theory uh, describes how the curvature of space-time is affected by matter, and in turn affects matter. Okay, that's the structure of these equations. But the simplest context to study these equations in which there's no matter other than space-time itself. Okay? Already his equations are non-trivial even in this context. A, a context where there's no matter, just space-time itself. The dynamics of space-time itself, for instance, these rippling geometries of space-time, are already non-trivial things to study within his theory. And Schwarzschild found a solution to the equations of motion describing just pure space-time with no matter itself. Okay? The solution he found was very interesting. It far away, there was an origin in the solution. Okay? So the solution, roughly speaking, could be thought of as some object. Far away from this origin, space-time just became flat. But when he went near to this, this origin, space-time became more and more warped in a way I will describe to you in more detail. Uh, in, a way, in a way that was sort of strange. This was an exact solution to Einstein's equation. Okay? Some, a lump of warped space-time sitting somewhere in space. This solution is now, now called a black hole. Um, now, okay, I'm going to tell you a little more about the solution. This is meant to be some sort of strange, um, uh, uh, highly inaccurate, okay, some, some, some sort of cartoon of, 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 of a black hole. Every, far out here we have flat space, and as you go inside, you go to the origin of the, uh, of the space time towards where the black hole is sitting, space becomes more and more. Inside a spherical black hole, spherically symmetrical black hole, which is all I talk about in this talk for simplicity, um, there are two surfaces of particular interest. The first is um, a surface of fi uh, a sphere of a finite radius, which has a name. It's called the event horizon. I'll tell you what that is. Uh, and then there is what in this diagram shows up as a point called the singularity. It's like the center of the black hole. Okay. As I mentioned before, the solution describes warped space with nothing in it. There's no star or fluid or anything like that. It's just space itself warped by itself. At least outside the singularity, um, where the equations of our theory break down, and we don't really know what's going on there. And there could be stuff hidden there that we don't see. But everywhere outside that singularity, the solution is just pure space in this warped way. Okay. Um, now, the really, really funny thing about black hole is that there is a region of space time which is. Um, from which nothing can ever emerge out of the black hole. Okay, so suppose you, you're in a spaceship, you're going like this. If you were here, you wanted to, you could reverse your spaceship and accelerate out fast enough if you had a powerful enough motor. But if you went like this and you happen to go inside this region, you go past the event horizon, no matter how fast you turn around, no matter how fast you reverse, or how fast you, you, you shoot your motor, you will be dragged into the singularity. This is true of rockets, but it's also true of light. If you were here and you tried to send a signal to your friend by, by sending a, oops, <laughs> by sending a, oops, by sending a laser burst, uh, fortunately in this room I can do it. If you tried this in the black hole, 
you sent your laser light, the light, you, you thought you were sending it outwards, but it would, you know, even if you pushed directly outwards, the light would go back in and bang into the signal. Nothing, not even light from this region uh, can emerge outside, uh, outside the event horizon of the black hole. The event horizon is this point of no return. Once you go in, nothing ever comes out, not even infrared. Classically, okay, within classical Einstein's equation. We'll come back to this as we, as we go. Okay, now I want to explain, I, I, I've said a lot of words and all of this uh, that sounds very weird to most of you. So I want to give you a rough analogy which has many inaccuracies but also, but, uh, but, 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 but capture some features of what the black hole is really doing. Okay, so this analogy goes as follows. So imagine a lake. Imagine a lake which is far away from a central point, still and placid, nothing's happening, the water is just still. Okay, but then there is a central point in the lake in which, fr from which in the floor of the lake, water is somehow being sucked out. I don't know how, maybe there's an alien who's got a huge pump, whatever, whatever it is, okay. Ah, water is being sucked out from the central point in the lake. So now because of the law of conservation of mass of water in this problem, okay, water is being sucked out, so it must be flowing from the outside of the lake into that place where it's being sucked out. Now, you can imagine that because as you go nearer and nearer to this point, the surface area is becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, a certain amount of volume flow has to happen because a certain volume is being sucked out per unit time. That means the water has to be moving faster and faster into, the, uh, into, the, uh, into this region. So the flow of this water, let's say, is radial and it's going like this and it's moving, the water is moving faster and faster and faster as you go towards the, same, the, the, the central point. Now imagine you, you are a tourist motoring on this lake, okay? And you have a boat that, that has a maximum speed with respect to still water, that maximum speed is 100 kilometers per hour, okay? This blue line here is the line at which the speed of the water as it moves towards the central point exceeds 100 kilometers per hour. Here it's less than 100 kilometers per hour, here it's more than that, is this clear? Okay, you're motoring around in this lake and as you motor around, you want, you're curious about the singularity, you come here, you take a look at it and then decide, okay, I don't want to go further because I'll be sucked in. So you turn around and you motor out. You can do that because the speed of your boat faster than the speed of the water with respect to the ground. But if you make the mistake of getting in here, you turn around and you try to motor back, it doesn't matter. You're going to be sucked in because the speed of the water moving towards the singularity faster than the, the, that, that your boat can go um, with respect to the water. Now, of course, in this particular problem, um, this blue line here, so this blue line is, is the analog of the event horizon. This place where the water is being sucked out is the analog of the singularity. And in this particular problem, this blue line here uh, is sort of observer dependent. Because if somebody else came with a faster boat, he would have another blue line, maybe here. If somebody came with a slower boat, he would have another blue line, maybe here. But you see, in the universe, there is a speed limit. Nothing moves faster than the speed of light. So we should imagine that there is a speed limit for boats in this analogy. Boats can be slower, but they can't be faster than a particular speed. And we've drawn that blue line here as the blue line for the fastest boat. Once you do that, nothing that ever goes in can ever come out. It's sort of like a black hole. Okay, there are many things about this analogy that are inaccurate. And yet it's not a worthless analogy because it gives you a way of thinking about what's going on. Okay. Excellent. So this is what the black hole singular, uh, black hole solution looks like. Any questions or comments? Any brief questions? Or comments? Okay. Any time through my talk, you want to interrupt me with questions, comments, or objections? Fine. I reserve the right to say I'll answer later if it's going to take me too far off. But anything brief, clarificatory that you want to ask? Yes. Loudly. Yes. Then. That's coming. It's a very good question. I'm going, I'm going to tell, uh, tell you about it. Okay. okay, excellent question. The question, okay, uh, let's, let's, let's go on. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, so far what I told you about was just about a, sen a solution, a, mathematic solu a mathematical solution of Einstein's equations of general relativity. Somebody wrote this down on a pen and paper. The question of 
whether these black holes are real and if so, how are they formed, which is basically your question, was not addressed by what I told you. Okay. And in fact, Einstein, you know, when he, when he saw the solution, um, was very appreciative of its mathematical beauty and elegance, but felt it was a physically unreasonable solution. It described a solution to its equations of motion that could not reasonably be created in a, phys in a reasonable physical situation because it was just too weird. He published several papers objecting to the physical nature of the solution. Yeah. Another example of a person who creates a theory not understanding it very well. Einstein made many, had many wrong papers. And, and, and that's great. Somebody who doesn't have the courage to be wrong will never say anything important that way. Okay, uh, in my opinion. Okay, so, 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 but anyway, so Einstein and all, all his friends and you know, all the people around the 1950, 1990, by and large regarded the solution as a mathematical artifact without corresponding physical reality, at least in the world that we, we see. Okay, and this story changed with this gentleman here, Subramanyam Chandrasekhar, who began to ask what at first sight seem, seemed to be a completely different question. Uh, that's the question you were alluding to. The question that Ch Chandrasekhar asked was, what happens to stars after they finish burning all their nuclear fuel? So now what does this question mean? You see, a star is a huge collection of matter. And uh, if you've got this huge collection of matter, the self, ma you know, matter gravitates. So the, the matter of the star self gravitates. And if gravity was the only force in the game, all the matter in the star would, would want to scrunch down to the central singularity, that's the, centr the center of the sphere. What stops that? Hey, we know the sun is stable, it's not scrunching down into the center of anything. Why not? Now, what, what, opposes, uh, what opposes gravity? Well, when the sun is burning, it's burning its hydrogen into helium through fusion. It's producing a lot of heat. So the sun is a very hot object. That heat comes with an associated pressure. And ultimately, it's the, the banging of these molecules, the pressure of the sun, that opposes the force of gravity. Okay? Pressure differential is more, more accurate, since you guys know all about this. Um, uh, oppose the gravitational attraction and allow for a steady equation. Okay. This pressure differential can only come with a temperature differential. The temperature differential can only come because of a constant source of, of heat through the fusion. Great. That's how a star su survives in equilibrium when it's alive, when it's burning fuel. But all stars eventually run out of nuclear fuel. Our sun will probably in about 5 billion years run out of hydrogen. It will all be helium. Maybe some ad additional fusion processes will happen, helium into something else and so on. Maybe eventually that will all stop. So once all the nuclear fuel is burnt out, what happens to this, this stuff? Now this pressure differential, this temperature-induced pre pressure differential cannot sustain it anymore. So the, st the star will start to scrunch onto itself. And unless some other opposing force opposes the scrunch, the scrunch will keep going. So the question that Chandrasekhar asked was, what could oppose the scrunch? And what he did was to apply the w what was then a quite, quite recently developed theory, the theory of quantum mechanics to this question. Okay, you see, within the, the theory of quantum mechanics, all of you, all of you guys, everyone in this room really knows that within quantum mechanics there are two kinds of particles: there are fermions and bosons. Right. The constituents of matter, the, the elementary constituents of matter, at a simple level. Let's say electrons and protons, okay, are, uh, are, are both fermions. Now, all of you know that fermions have this famous, obey this famous, famous Fermi exclusion principle, which tells you that if you've got two identical fermions, let's say two electrons, they cannot be in exactly the same state. Fermions dislike each other, dislike their, they're like tigers. Okay. They, they dislike their, um, their uh, uh, identical other fermions, okay? And the mathematical version of that statement is that you've got a fermion in one state, you cannot put an electron in one state, you cannot put an, another electron in exactly the same state. Now, suppose I've got a little box, a box of some, some radius, and I put a bunch of electrons, okay? 
I put one electron, it goes into the lowest energy state it can find. I put the next electron, it cannot go back, it go into that lowest energy state. It has to go into slightly higher energy state. Does this by having slightly higher momentum. Okay? I put the next electron, it does it by having even more momentum and so on. So you see that when you now, as, as the momentum of the electron keeps increasing, its energy keeps increasing. As you add it up, what you get is um, a certain energy of this substance, which is a function of the volume in which it's, it lives. Now, since the momenta of this electron are quantized in units of 1 over r, if you do the calculation, what you will find is that the energy of this, uh, the energy that comes just the ground state energy, it's coming just from quantum mechanics, of this substance becomes larger and larger as r becomes smaller and smaller. What does this mean? This means that there is an effective quantum pressure opposing a bunch of electrons to scrunch to a smaller volume. Is this clear? Because they can only do that by going to higher and higher energies. Is this clear? And so the derivative of the energy with respect to the radius gives you an effective opposing force that opposes scrunching. Okay? So Chandrasekhar realized this and he, he, he postulated that uh, this, this, this force has a name, it's called the degeneracy pressure. That this degeneracy pressure of electrons perhaps is the opposing force that allows um, matter to equilibrate from a star once it's run out of nuclear fuel. And indeed, we believe that, that uh, this is correct for stars that are small enough, roughly less than twice the mass of the sun. Okay? Now, there's a slightly complicated story involving electrons and protons squeezing into neutrons and slightly complicated details which I wouldn't, wouldn't get, get into. But what Chandrasekhar also found was that when the mass of the remaining star was large enough, let's say significantly larger than twice the mass of the sun, this opposing quantum force was not strong enough. Not even this degeneracy pressure could resist the pull of gravity. And indeed, Chandrasekhar could think of nothing else, nothing that could resist this crunching pull of gravity. So he suggested that, well, since there's no option, what the matter must be doing is just continually, for these big enough stars, continually scrunching down, 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 until they reach a point. Now, what happens at this point? God knows. Where the equations of physics, as we know them, break down. But everywhere else, there's no matter left. It's all scrunched away. So what's left is just a, a lump of space and time. And then Chandrasekhar looked around and said, has anyone described this lump of space and time? Aha, uh -huh, Schwarzschild had. So he proposed that what was left behind was a black hole. When it was where, where, from stars that were massive enough. Is this clear? Did, did that answer your question? Okay. Now, if Chandrasekhar, please. Uh, once they sink into this point, once they go right, do right down to this point, you see what happens there. Technically, at this point, there's matter with infinite density. And our, the equations of physics as we know them break down. You know, to answer your question, we would need to have, let's say, a quantum theory of gravity to answer what goes on. So I don't know the answer to that. I, well, they don't lose their identity, okay? I mean, that would violate the basic rules of quantum mechanics. But exactly the details of what happens, uh, uh, no, nobody knows the answer. Good question. Okay, um, so now, let's see. So now if Chandrasekhar is right, this is exactly the opposite of what Einstein said. You know, Einstein said, well, the Schwarzschild solution is a nice solution. It sounds physically unreasonable, so there must be, the car. there's probably some rule preventing these things from ever forming. Chandrasekhar not only I'm, I'm basically identified a very plausible phys physical mechanism for the formation of these black holes, and argued that massive enough stars always end up as black holes. So roughly speaking, there must be as many black holes in the universe as stars. Okay, people give, this is too rough, but astrophysicists have ranges of estimates. One, one estimate is roughly 1,000 as many black holes as stars. Now, how many stars are there in the visible universe? That's something like 100 billion stars in our galaxy, 10 to the 11 stars in our galaxy. 
and something like uh, 10 to the 11 galaxies in the visible universe. So something like 10 to the power 22 stars in the visible universe. Okay, let's say 1,000th of these are black holes, then there are 10 to the power 19 black holes in the visible universe. And that's a lot of black holes. So not only can they form, they do form in copious numbers. Our universe is full of them. And I think the 10 to the 19 may be an underestimate. Un I don't, I think it's unlikely to be an overestimate. We don't really know. LIGO will find out. We don't really know. Okay. So now suddenly, if you believe Chandra Shekhar, not only are these black holes physical, the universe is full of them. Okay. So you know, there's a long, long story which I'm not going, I'm not describing all of this. There's the work involved in the singularity theorem and so on. I will not describe that here. Uh, there's a long story, but increasingly, since the 1960s, increasingly physicists took these ideas of Chandrasekhar, which we initially largely ignored. Okay. There's this beautiful paper by Oppenheimer and Snyder, and that's, uh, but largely ignored. Uh, but increasingly, various developments in the theory of gravity forced people to take, take this idea more and more seriously. And from the 60s and 70s onwards, astrophysicists started looking out into the sky to see, could they identify, could they actually see black holes? Now, this might seem like a strange question. Because I told you that black holes are those things that cannot be seen. You know, once you go inside the black hole, even if you shine this laser, it doesn't come out. Nothing comes out of the black hole. So how can you see a black hole? Well, the way you see a black hole is not by seeing the black hole itself, but by seeing the effects it has on nearby things. See, a black hole is a very compact, massive object. And so, if there's, let's say, a star near it, it can start ripping away the gas from that star, which will come and sort of circulate around the black hole, come very near to it, and then whoosh it. While it goes, it emits a great deal of energy. You can see that. Okay? So astrophysicists started looking for such things. And as soon as they started looking, they found many, many candidates for such things. Many objects that looked like they were caused by a, an object so compact, by, co by the gravitational force of an object, so compact that known, nothing in known physics, it could be nothing in known physics other than black. Okay, but of course you could always wonder whether there were things that you don't know about that could be causing this, this swirl. That's not a black hole. This question was answered, at least like 80% answered, um, in a beautiful experiment performed over the last decade and whose results were first announced maybe two years ago. This experiment called LIGO. LIGO was, a, was, was, a, was, a, was an experiment in which uh, physicists on Earth looked for these gravitational waves, these ripples in space time that I told you about. These waves had never been seen before. And about two years ago, LIGO announced that they'd seen gravitational waves. That was very exciting. But even more exciting was than the fact that they'd seen gravitational waves was the fact that their analysis revealed that the gravitational wave that they saw had a remarkable source. The source was this. About 1.2 billion light years away, there were two black holes, each about 30 times the mass of the sun, orbiting around each other. As they orbited, they lost energy into gravitational radiation, so they came nearer and nearer and nearer to each other. At some point, they came so close together that the two event horizons banged into each other. And the black holes merged. In a dramatic event, they went from two black holes to one black hole. Okay, LIGO claims to have seen the gravitational waves coming out, out of this collision. Now, I want to take two minutes to give you, to convey the, the drama of what the events that LIGO claims to have seen uh, has. You see, I told you that these two black holes each have um, energy roughly 30 times that of the sun. Okay. Um, Collision, according to LIGO, took place, well, you can estimate it, took place in about a hundredth of a second. In the process of the collision, the net amount of energy released was energy equal to three solar masses. Okay? Now, just to understand how dramatic that is, let's do the, let's do, let's remember the following thing. The sun will live for 10 billion years. In those 10 billion years, it will lose roughly 1% of its rest mass as solar radiation. The sun is giving out a lot of energy, right? What it does is, is lose one, turn 1% 1 of rest mass into energy 
over a period of 10 billion years. Now a year is, you guys probably know better than me, something like 10 to the power 7 seconds. Uh, so let's see, so 10 billion years is, is about 10 to the 17 seconds. In that process, in 10, uh, 10 to the 17 seconds, this, this object loses 1 hundredth of a solar mass. In this black hole, this black hole collision lost three solar masses, so 300 times as much energy in one hundredth of a second. Okay, so the intensity of of energy emission was 10 to the 17 times 300 times 100. So that's what is it? 10, 3 into 10 to the 21 times the intensity of emission of energy from the sun in this event. We've already estimated that there are about 10 to the 21, 10 to the 22 stars in the whole universe. So if you believe my estimate, the intensity of em energy emission from this, this, this bang was equal to approximately the sum of the intensities of emissions of all the stars in the u visible universe for that one one hundredth of a second. It was quite an event. Uh, LIGO has done a more serious estimate than we did just now. They came up with the estimate of 50 times the intensity of all the stars in the universe in that one bang. Only for one hundredth of a second now. But the intensity was amazing, blinding. The reason that we were not all blinded by it was it was all emitted in gravitational radiation, which If it was emitted in light, ooh, it would have been an event. Okay. Okay. So the great thing about this is that this 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 the LIGO experiment has caught, you know has caught the black holes behaving extremely black holey, uh, and actually seen it because the two event horizons of the black holes overlap. So if if these black holes were you know, some other thing that was twice the radius of a black hole surrounded by some other mysterious thing, they were their collision would behave very differently from the collision of two actual black holes. LIGO already claims to have done some analysis to say that what they see is in good agreement with what you'd expect from general relativity from the collision of two black holes. In another 10 years, they will have seen thousands of events. There'll be no doubt that what we've seen here is an actual black hole, the black holes of general relativity. Okay, so let's, let's, let's shed skepticism. Let's say that there's already very good reason to believe, and um, there will be even better be reason to believe in 10 years. We will be clinching that what, we've, like, what LIGO has seen is actual black holes. Okay, so now, I think by now, the observational evidence that black holes exist is more or less convincing. Okay, so now that we, we've gone from Einstein skepticism to almost surety of the existence of these black holes, let's try to get them get to know them a little better. Okay, any questions or comments about this? Okay, excellent. Uh, th this is what I've already said. Okay, now. Within Einstein's, within the class, I, I, I want to tell you a little bit more about black holes. Okay, so people studying classical Einstein's classical theory of general relativity have proved many theorems about the behaviors of black holes. I want to quote two of them to you. These two theorems were actually both proved by Hawking, uh, both of which knew, made crucial use of uh, work done by this this man, uh, this professor, Professor A. K. Raichaudhary, a great Indian. Uh, um, general relativist who taught in Presidency College for many, many years before he passed away. I mean, ten or, I, I'm not sure exactly when, but maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, uh, and whose work has had deep and lasting impact on the study of the theory of black holes. Okay. Um, the two theorems I want to quote to you are the following. The first theorem is this. The area of a black hole, the area of the event horizon of a black hole, can stay the same in time, or can increase in time, but can never do. This is theorem number one. The second theorem is that, technically stated, horizons are not bifurcated, which colloquially means that one black hole can never split up in early time, as time progresses forward. One black hole can never, never split up into two. Now, what does this mean for, you know, for, for a black hole? Well, one thing it means is that a black hole within classical general relativity can never be destroyed. Okay? Because you see what, suppose I've got an object, let's say, I don't know, a cricket ball. What do you mean by destroying it? Well, you could break it up into many little pieces. That would destroy the ball. But black holes cannot be broken up into 
in the pieces. Or if you could somehow, I don't know, let it evaporate away or something like that, that would destroy it. But, but black hole areas cannot decrease. So black hole cannot become smaller than it was, cannot break up into many pieces, can't be destroyed. Uh, let's uh, uh, just, 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 just to give you a, a feeling for what, what this means, let's imagine the following thought experiment. Uh, yes? Uh, so can a black hole be stretched? What does stretched mean? I mean, the tidal forces. Can it be squ squished? Yes, it can. But no matter what you do, the net size of the event horizon, the net area of the event horizon cannot be made to decrease. You can stretch it out, for instance. So even it can be stretched out indefinitely. Uh, you see, this stretching indefinitely will require putting some force. You know, the black hole likes to be a sphere, just like a soap bubble likes to be a sphere. Okay. Now, by applying appropriate forces, you can stretch it out. But as you stretch more and more and more, you require more and more force. It's true that by doing extreme things, you can stretch it out indefinitely. That's true. Why can it never break? Why can it never break? Okay. Why can it never? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I see where you're coming from. You're saying, well, if I can stretch it out like this, I can, it can do this and break up. Right? No, that's so bubbles can break. It's true. Um, let me be more precise. The theorem actually states that any solution of general relativity that describes the breaking of two black holes necessarily encounters a singularity. That is a place where something becomes infinite. Okay? So the precise theorem is that within classic, when that happens, classical general relativity breaks down. Okay? So the precise theorem is that classical general relativity cannot describe the breaking of two black holes. Okay? It is possible that in reality, uh, usually, such possibilities that have been studied involve some quantum stuff. Okay? That allows some sort of breaking, but not within classical general relativity. In fact, we will, I will tell you about in the last part of the talk another way in which black holes are destroyed by quantum stuff, by Hawking radius. Okay. I feel I've not answered your question very well. Uh, why can the black holes never break? It's just a fact. You know, I mean, um, I, I don't know what else to say. I, I, I'll try to say, see if I can say. But you understand, right? It's just a mathematical theorem you can prove. That there's no solution of general relativity that can describe such a thing without a singularity happening somewhere. If singularity has never happened, this will never happen. Okay. Okay. Excellent. I, I, I think I've even said it here. A black hole can never be destroyed without doing something clever and quantum. And that's the, the, the ex escape clause. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but just 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 to give you a feeling for how uh, what what this means, you know. Suppose um, tomorrow ISRO issues us an alert, alert, says, "Okay, we've got bad news. There's a black hole and collision caused with Earth. Uh, it's going to come, and a month from now we are all going to be swallowed up in the black hole. Uh, what can we do? Well, you know, maybe once we communicate to the U.S., President Trump will say, unleash the nuclear arsenal at the black hole. <laughs> uh, break that guy up into smithereens. It won't work. <laughs> this, this, this thing will absorb the radiation of nuclear energy and become bigger. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, the only thing we could do in such a situation is to divert the black hole. Black holes can't be destroyed, but they can be pushed away. We could try to do that. That would be the sense of the thing. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, let's, 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 let's move on. Black holes are also, uh, well, I, I want to tell you more about black holes. Black holes, it turns out that black holes are the most compact objects in the universe. What does this mean? It, this means that if I give you a, suppose I take a black hole of a certain mass. I give you something else of the same mass. Let's assume for my statement to make it precise for the moment that it's both are spherically symmetric. Then that something else will have to have a radius that is larger than the radius of the black hole. This is the theorem you can prove. Okay. There is no object of a given mass that is smaller than the black hole of that mass. So the black, ho black holes are the most compact, compact objects that exist. Okay. But, but when I say radius, I'm talking about the radius of the event horizon. Okay. A lot, one more thing that I want to tell you about, and that's very important, is this. That black holes are like objects. They can move around, do all kinds of things. But if you take the 
time in flat space time, but space time where not, nothing is happening, and you let them settle down. M maybe you take a black hole, you throw an asteroid into it, so it swishes around, does all kinds of things. So then you wait for a while, it settles down. You wait long enough, black holes settle down into s solutions, all of which we know, which are labeled by very few parameters. They're labeled by the mass of the black hole and the angular momentum of the black hole. Also, if they charge black holes by the charge of the black hole. Okay? But there's a few, a small finite number of numbers, depending on your assumptions, like three for angular momentum plus one for mass. Let's say there's no charge. Four numbers. By four numbers, completely label the black hole. Okay? The full set of equilibrium black hole solutions labeled just by four conserved charges. This, this statement is something sometimes called the no hair theorem. Uh, John Wheeler, I believe, said, worded the statement in a way I can't quite understand. I mean, I don't know why he used the words, but uh, he, he worded the statement as with, with these words, black holes have no hair. Forget those words. The statement that equilibrium solutions of black holes are characterized by four conserved charges in the absence of mass. Okay. Now, this is quite dramatic. Dramatic for the following reason. We've talked about how black holes form. Black holes form, let's say, by the collapse of stars. Now, let's say I've got, I've got star number one. You've got star number two. Both stars have no, zero angular momentum in my, in my thought experiment. My star was lithium rich. Your star was, I don't know, beryllium rich. It's, I don't know at all if those are possible. But that's, that's okay. Okay. Both of them collapse into black holes of the same mass. The final black hole solution doesn't care about whether the black hole was formed by the lithium rich star or the beryllium rich star. It's just the same solution. Okay. There's something strange about this that we're going to come to in a little while. Yes? What about a black hole made of antimatter? Ma made of antimatter. You see, antimatter, if it's neutral antimatter, that's, well, you're probably thinking of something like positron. Okay? That will be distinguished by black holes made of just electrons okay, by charge. But suppose I had a, um, a black hole made of anti-electrons and anti-protons. Okay? Neutral charge, the final black hole would be exactly the same solution as black hole made of electrons and protons. So the black hole remembers nothing about what makes it up other than conserved charge. But wasn't there something like amount of antimatter plus matter is conserved or something? Amount of antimatter plus matter is conserved? Uh, no, in fact, it's not true. There's this CPT theorem. And in fact, within, uh, uh, the, in fact, within, uh, within the a theory of gravity, there is a theorem you can say. Says that no global symmetry are absolutely conserved in a theory of gravity. And one of the reasons for that is precisely what you're saying. Ordinary processes might conserve a glo global symmetry, something like what you're saying, some version of what you're saying. But black hole processes violate. Okay. Quantum mechanics, together with gravity, violates all global symmetry. Only things that are absolutely conserved are gate symmetry, gate charge. Okay. So something like angle. Uh, momentum, angular momentum, those are absolutely conserved. Charge is absolutely conserved because it's coupled to a gate field, electromagnetic. No global symmetry is absolutely conserved in the presence of black hole. Okay, so exactly the same solution. Yeah, it's a very good question. Okay. Now, uh, this seems strange in many ways, right? You've got completely different matter giving you the same eventual solution. And you might think that this violates some basic rule of physics, more or less like the intuition you had. Okay. Um, and this, 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 this feature of black holes leads us to an almost paradox okay, that I will now spend the rest of the talk trying to explain to you. It's called Hawking's information paradox. I'm going to try to explain that paradox to you and, uh, um, and, and, and what we can say about it. Okay. Uh, but, my, but, but in order to do that, I want to, I'm going to have to introduce a completely new notion, one that has not entered our talk before. This is the notion of entry. Okay. So hang on with me for five minutes before we take a detour into something that has no black holes in it. We'll come back to the black holes five minutes. Okay. All of you know that physical systems are characterized by energy. Yeah, energy is actually quite a strange concept. When energy was first, as a concept was first invented, um, it had a limited, um, yeah, there was a limited idea of what energy was. But as people realized that physics had more and more and more than they first thought, as 
for instance, the electromagnetic field came into physics. Um, the old notions of energy would no longer be conserved. Then people kept realizing that you could enlarge the notion of energy so that this enlarged object was a, conser a conserved quantity. Okay. So physical systems are governed by energy. Formulas for energy keep changing as you keep, uh, as, you in as your understanding of physics becomes more and more sophisticated. But the fact that the existing energy which is always conserved has never changed because it follows from a cement. Now, in the 1800s, physicists studying improbably now, steam engines, uh, hit upon another fundamental law of nature that reminds you in some ways of the conservation of energy and in some ways is different. And uh, uh, what, 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 what they explained to us was the following. That if you look at complicated enough systems, okay, I will say a little bit about, th about what that means. Then in addition to being, being characterized by the energy, these complicated enough systems are characterized by another, uh, another number called the entropy. And the claim of these physicists in the, in the 1800s was that the entropy always also obeyed a sort of law. Now the law of entropy wasn't that entropy was always conserved. That's, how, that's how it works with energy. That's not how it works with entropy. The law of entropy is more interesting. The law is that entropy can remain constant or can increase in time, but can never decrease. Once you account for all the entropy of all parts of the universe, system plus in time. This law is called, sometimes called the second law of thermodynamics. The law that energy is always conserved when you heat energy as well. Uh, it's sometimes called the first law of thermodynamics. That's a simple law. This is more sophisticated, in many ways more interesting law. Um, entropy can remain the same or can increase, but can never decrease. Now I want to explain this to you uh, in the next three or four minutes to give you a rough intuitive notion of what, what's going on and why this is so. So imagine a following, the following experiment. I've got two chambers, in one of which I've got uh, hydrogen molecules, the other of which I've got oxygen molecules, and I've got a stopper between these two chambers. So the right has only oxygen, and the left has only hydrogen. Okay, now if I open the stopper, what's going to happen? Well, some of the oxygen from the right will move to the left, some of the hydrogen from the left will move to the right, and we'll end up in a situation something like this. Now, suppose I were to do the following experiment in my head. You know, I started with a situation like this with the stopper closed, and then I released the stopper. Would the reverse happen? Tell me not. This way is very likely to happen. Ah, this way would require a miracle, especially if there's 20, 10 to the power 23 molecules here and 10 to the power 22 molecules there. Okay. Now, one way of formalizing this idea goes as follows. Let's suppose that uh, there was a way of measuring how many possible states the oxygen molecules could be in. For instance, suppose you divided up this flask into little cubicles, and the oxygen being in any one of these cubicles was one, a molecule being in any one of these cubicles was one state. It's very crude. That's not how the actual counting is done, but just roughly. Okay. Now, if you count how many states are there for the hydrogen and oxygen to be in, when all the hydrogen is here and all the oxygen is here, that's clearly less than the number of states for the hydrogen and oxygen to be in. If all the hydrogen is allowed to go everywhere, all the oxygen is allowed to go everywhere. So just probabilistically, a motion that starts with fewer allowed states will tend to the place where there's more allowed room. Just probabilistically, something, this is a very unprobable configuration. If you've created it and you uncork it, it's likely to move here. The reverse is very unlikely to happen. Okay? Entropy is a measure of how many different states a system has can be in, subject to some overall macroscopic constraint. The overall macroscopic constraints in this situation would be the volume of the two beakers, the number of hydrogen molecules, the number of oxygen molecules. Subject to these overall macroscopic con constraints, usually conserved quantities, like the number of molecules. Okay? How many states can the system be in? And the idea is simply that, that the law of increase of entropy is simply a statement of probability. That systems tend to the place where, there are, where there's more phase space, more kinds of ways in which they can be rather than the other way around. 
Okay. So I have already said this. Eh, this motion seems likely, this motion seems very unlikely. Now, also what I am going to say here will play no, no further role in the talk. There is a caveat I thought I should mention and then we can forget about it, but let me mention it. The law of increase of entropy is a probabilistic statement and not an absolute statement, unlike the law of conservation of energy. Okay. At the microscopic level, these molecules moving to this has a reverse motion that can, that, that can happen. It is just that when you start with molecules in this system, the chance that your initial conditions will be so tuned, so that you will undertake that reverse motion is very, very small. So the law of increase of entropy is a statement about probability and a statement about probabilities that becomes overwhelmingly like certainties when the number of constituents becomes very, very large. Okay? So it is not an absolute law like conservation of energy, but a probabilistic statement. However, a probabilistic statement that in certain limits, namely the limits in which the number of constituents goes to infinity becomes essentially exact. Okay, so with that caveat out of the, out of the way, let us move on. Now, as I have said, though the second law of thermodynamics applies only probabilistically, it works almost un, with un, almost unfailing accuracy in large enough systems. And there is a certain sense in which the law of entropy increase is as uh, robust as the law of energy increase. As, as we learn more and more physics, we have to change our way of counting states, the states a system can be in, change our way of giving formulas for entropy. But as we learn more and more physics, what changes is our formulas for entropy, not the fact that there always exists an entropy and that that entropy always increases. So it is a universal law, sort of meta law that goes beyond the particular theories of physics we happen to be working with at the moment, like the law of conservation of energy. Okay. So now with this, uh, oh, one last thing I have to say about entropy is that it is Entropy is closely tied to the notion of temperature. I won't try to explain this to you unless someone presses me. Uh, but uh, uh, in the study of statistical mechanics or thermodynamics, there's a formula for the temperature of a system once you know its energy. If you know the entropy of a system as a function of its energy, then 1 over del S by del, del E gives you the temperature. Okay. This is a fact which I won't try to explain to you unless you press me. For now, let's move on. Okay, so enough about for our interlude on entropy. Now let's come back to black holes. Now you see, I told you that the law of conservation of entropy, uh, sorry, increase of entropy, was the universal law. It survived, for instance, the people who were working with three dimensions knew only about classical physics, and they formulated the law in the classical arena. Quantum mechanics happened about 100 years ago. Quantum mechanics revolutionized physics, changed our conceptual framework for many things. Physics. It did not, what, 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 among the other things it did not change is the law of conservation of energy. Another thing that did not change was the laws of thermodynamics. Laws of thermodynamics sailed through unscathed by the change from classical to quantum mechanics. Thermodynamics continues on. Formulas for entropy change, but not the laws. Okay. So, in the 1970s, a young Israeli physicist, Jacob Beckenstein, who was a PhD student at Princeton working under John Wheeler, was called by his advisor and uh, was asked to consider the following thing. Um, his advisor, Wheeler, suggested to him that it seemed like in the presence of black holes, th the theory of gravity violates the second law of thermodynamics. And his picturesque way of saying it was, well, suppose I'm sitting outside a black hole, I'm drinking a cup of tea and I throw the cup of tea into the black hole. The tea carries some entropy. Once the cup of tea vanishes behind the event horizon, the, 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 the cup, all knowledge of what, what made up the black hole is gone, in particular knowledge of the entropy is that. Okay? So it would appear that from a practical point of view, from a point of view of somebody sitting outside the event horizon, the entropy of the black hole, the entropy of the universe has decreased, violating the law of conservation, uh, the law of increase of entropy. Well, all our previous experience with physics before is that you know, when you have a conflict between a theory and thermodynamics, thermodynamics wins. So well, what is going on here? Um, now Bekenstein was uh, just around the time Wheeler suggested this problem to Bekenstein, uh, Hawking had come up with this area increase theorem. 
the theorem that for a event horizon areas of black holes always increase and never decrease. Um, and these two things remind, uh, Bekenstein remind, felt that this, this sounded interesting. And what he did was the, then suggest the following. He suggested that thermodynamics arrives in the presence of black holes, but we have to change the formula for it. And there is a new term in the equation for entropy. One term, the entropy of everything else in the universe. And there's another term which is proportional to the area of the event horizons of all black holes in the universe. And when you add this extra term in the formula for entropy, then entropy will always increase. This is something he proposed and sketched with many thought experiments that if you modify the law of area in uh, you know, entropy increase in this, in this fashion, uh, if you modify the law of entropy increase in this fashion, then the second law of thermodynamics is never violated. Um, uh, uh, Bekenstein performed relatively crude thought experiments. By now, we understand this very well. And this seems correct. Okay, there are many sort of semi proofs of this. Okay, now, so Bekenstein went ahead to, pro uh, to propose that black holes actually carry their entropy. And the formula for the entropy, where have I written that down, is here. The entropy is the air, well, he didn't know the proportionality. Term. The formula for the entropy was a proportion, some number times the area of the event horizon. Now, you know, Hawking uh, in written text admits that this paper of Bekenstein irritated him very much. He felt that it was a classic example of misuse of wonderful physics. His beautiful area increase theorem, which is a precise mathematical statement, had been misused into this thermodynamic mash. Okay. Uh, and he didn't like it at all. So he, he set about trying to <coughs> find an argument to disprove, to, to, to demonstrate that this was not true. And one of the things he did was to use this basic thermodynamic fact. If a black hole carries an entropy proportional to its area, according to this formula, it must carry a temperature. And Hawking thought that this was self-manifestly ridiculous, because things that carry a temperature radiate. But it's you know, an intrinsic feature of black holes that things go into them and nothing comes out. How could it be? It just shows that this Bekenstein stuff was not. Or was it? Bekenstein was unable to compute, Bekenstein was unable to, you know, seriously compute, um, uh, to compute the proportionality constant behind his area, uh, behind the area. But rough arguments suggested that that proportionality constant was proportional to 1 over h bar. h bar is, new, is the uh, Planck constant. Now, if the entropy is proportional to 1 over h bar, then del E by del S is proportional to H bar. So what you would get is a temperature that in the classical limit goes to zero. And everything we said about the black holes so far were classical states. So Hawking began to worry about where that might actually be, that black holes, once you included quantum mechanics into the game, actually did raise. And then he did what is one of the, one of the, in my opinion, one of the classic calculations of the last 40, 45 years. Um, and it's classic for the fact that it's extremely simple. Anyone, you know, anyone of you, once you took a quantum field theory course, could have done it. It's just that you wouldn't think of it. He, um, um, he, he, uh, he, 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 he did the following calculation. He asked, if you took three quantum fields, let's say three electrons, in the presence of a black hole, what happens to them? Okay. So the quantum behavior of these electrons is modified in a certain way. And when he did the calculation, I won't try try to review the calculation. When he did the calculation, he found that what happens is that uh, the electrons start quantum mechanically getting emitted out of the black hole, okay? In precisely the way that electrons would be if a black hole was at a particular temperature. Okay, um, I need to finish in the next three, four minutes, so I will not try to say more about this. But he found that quantum mechanically black holes radiate at a given temperature, and he found exactly what the temperature was. His calculation gave him an exact number, and then he found that that temperature was precise, that that, that radiation was black body radiation. It looked exactly thermal. If you, and matched exactly with Bekenstein's idea, if you identify the entropy of the black hole with C cube, A divided by 4 times Newton's constant. Uh, oh, and I missed the H bar here, sorry, there's an H bar here. 
h bar c cube a divided by cos a. Okay, now this was confirmation of the idea that he set out to kill. Looks like black holes do have a, uh, an entropy, do carry an entropy, because they radiate, and they, they, they obey the laws of thermodynamics if you associate the entropy, this entropy to the black hole. Okay, great. So at first sight it seems, now we're all happy. The second law of thermodynamics has been rescued, black holes carry entropy, everyone's happy. However, <coughs> Hawking realized that there was something about this picture that doesn't seem quite right. Okay, let me remind you what an entropy is. I've already told you that the entropy is a measure of the number of microstates a system can be in, consistent with a certain number of macroscopic con constraints. In this case, just a conservation law, a conserved quantity, mass, angular momentum of the black hole. Uh, by the way, if you compute uh, um, if you compute the entropy of a solar mass black hole using this formula, you will find that uh, the number of states associated with that black hole is e to the power s, where s is 10 to the power 78. So e to the power 10 to the power 78, the number of states associated with the black hole. It's an enormous number of states. Okay. Now, now there seems something wrong about this. I, is it okay? Five moments. There seems something wrong about this. And, you know, there's something dichotomous about this. Uh, some part of my talk I told you about a feature about the class classical black hole. They forget, lose, forget all information about what made them, what collapsed to make them up. Okay? So it seems like classical black holes in classical general relativity carry almost no information. They carry information only about conserved quantity. On the other hand, we now associate an entropy with black holes, which tells you that the fundamental description of this black hole is associated with an enormous number of states. Classically, the black, all black holes with the same charges are identical. Quantum mechanically, it must be that there is an enormous number of states, states associated with the black hole. Oh, doesn't this sound sort of problematic? Okay. Now, let's see. How can it be that a black hole is classically so simple and yet quantum mechanically so complex? An analogy may help us. Consider a glass of water. Okay. Um, consider a glass of water. Water can swish around and do all kinds of interesting things. But if you just leave it at rest, once it's finished swishing and it, com it comes to equilibrium, and the equilibrium is very simple. It's characterized by just a couple of quantities. The amount of water and let's say the temperature. Once you know those two things in equilibrium, you know everything there is to know about that water. Okay, yet a glass of water at a particular temperature carries an entropy, an entropy that all of you have studied about when you studied thermodynamics. Okay, so there is a description, namely the description of hydrodynamics, in which the glass of water in equilibrium is characterized by just the conserved charges. Yet we know that that has a fundamental shell. There's an enormous number of microstates that make up that glass, uh, that, that equilibrium configuration of water. There's these microstates are the details of how the molecules of the water are moving around. To, uh, to, to produce that water. So, uh, before the atomic theory of, of, what, of, of matter, you might have been puzzled. How can water, which is in a unique state, carry so much entropy? We now know that that unique state is just a statement of ignorance. We describing some, this, this system some coarse grain way that a basic microscopic degree of freedom we're not keeping track of, that gives rise to the entropy. So it must be that something like this is true of McLeary as well. The equations of gravity must be something like the equations of hydrodynamics that are giving you a coarse grain description of reality, throwing away detailed information of some more fundamental degrees of freedom, like the atoms of the water. Okay, so this is roughly the picture that we, we, we believe we have about black holes, and yet we're not yet home dry. Hawking pointed out that even if we believe everything I've just told you, there's something strange about, about this whole setup. And that goes as follows. Hawking did the following thought experiment. Uh, the thought experiment. The thought experiment he did was this. It was a version of the experiment we did five, 20 minutes ago. Consider two stars of exactly equal mass. One lithium rich, the other beryllium rich. Both of them collapse to give you black holes of exactly the same, uh, of exactly the same uh, uh, 
uh, of exactly the same mass. Now, at the quantum level, you could say, well, there was a lot of inf quantum information in the, in, in, the in the detailed construction of the matter that made up, that went to make up the black the black hole. That detailed information has not been lost precisely because black holes carry entropy. There's individual microstates the black hole can be in that can record what meant, went up to make up the matter. Quantum mechanics, we don't know how, but that could happen. Now Hawking said, well, let's take this one step further. Now what happens to this black hole? He discovered that the black holes radiate. And as far as he could tell, the radiation that he could get, he got, was determined just by the classical black hole solution and nothing else. So both these different black holes radiate and lose energy and eventually just radiate away to nothing in, as far as Hawking could tell, exactly the same way. And this, if, if this picture is correct, leads to a fundamental contradiction with the laws of well, all of physics, really, but in particular the laws of quantum mechanics. Because, you see, what you would have is two different initial states, namely the beryllium rich star and the lithium rich star evolving into identical final states, which never happen in physics. Technically, in quantum mechanics, evolution is unitary evolution. Okay, you can never have, if two final states are the same, the initial states are always. Okay, so uh, Hawking posed this as a paradox and actually proposed that uh, eventually when we understand the resolution of this, I'm getting really stupid. Uh, when, when we understand the resolution of this, we will find that we have to modify the laws of quantum mechanics to make some consistent with this, with black holes. We believe that's not the case, okay? Quantum mechanics, research in string theory over the last 40 years, and in particular the ADS-CFT correspondence, show no evidence that any, anything needs to be changed to the laws of quantum mechanics. We, we believe that this is, the Hawking's paradox is a false paradox, but let's, 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 let's talk about it a little more. In order to understand the paradox, let's first contrast it with a non-paradox, okay? Let's consider two different glasses of water. Okay, two different glasses of water that were formed in some different states. Both of these glasses of water evaporate away and lead to nothing. At the thermodynamic level, the evaporation, the, the, the thermodynamic properties of the gas that's evaporated away would, would be identical for these two glasses of water. And you might think we have the same paradox because you have different initial states going to f identical final states. But of course, it's a false paradox. The detailed state of this evaporated matter depends on the detailed states of the, of the water molecules in the initial glass. If you kept track of the detailed state of the final matter, matter will be influenced by what the actual water, mo water molecules were doing at the beginning. And so the, you know, the state of the vapor would be detailed in one-to-one -one correspondence with the state of the original gas, uh, water molecules in the glass. There's no paradox here. We understand everything really well. So you might think, well, suppose that perhaps that's, that's, that's also what's going on with black holes. We don't know what black holes are somehow co composed of uh, elementary constituents, except in toy models. In the ads cft correspondence of string theory, we understand what these constituents are. Okay, but it's, except in special toy models, we don't know what these constituents are, but you might say, well, perhaps the detailed state of the Hawking radiation is being influenced by what these constituents are. But Hawking, you know, Hawking asked us to take this a little further. Suppose these constituents live near the singularity of the black hole. Then, by causality, we've already seen that there's general features of physics that tell us that nothing inside the black hole can affect what's going on outside the black hole. In particular, Hawking's calculation of Hawking radiation in happened entirely from the event horizon. If the, if the atoms of the black hole live near the singularity, it does not seem that their details could, by causal consideration, could be imprinted on the outgoing radiation. So it must be that somehow the atoms of this stuff live near the event horizon. And if that's the case, uh, and maybe that's the picture you might have, but a group of physicists, including Samir Mathur from Ohio State University, and uh, various other people, uh, Almeri, Marol, Pulchinsky, and Sully, over three, four years ago, made precise a statement that somehow, in some way, we always knew, that, uh, uh, that if it were true, that there were atom-like atom configurations near, near the event horizon, and they imprinted the information into Hawking radiation, then that would cause the black holes, after radiating a bit, to become quantum mechanically extremely different from what they were classically. In particular, if a black hole 
started with some mass and radiated half its mass away. At the end of the radiation process, if we believe semi-classical laws of physics, the black hole horizon, which was a smooth place, which a spaceship could just sail through in classical theory, would, it appears, have turned into a, a terrible quantum firewall, a, a place which if you banged into, you'd be destroyed. I know I'm going very fast through this, but okay, let me just say it. Uh, all of these theorems make assumptions. They make assumptions about how physics works, and it could be that one of these assumptions breaks down. Okay? And indeed, these two gentlemen, Kiriakos Papadodimas and Suvarat Raju, both of whom were my PhD students at some point, um, came up with a, a beautiful suggest a solution to how Hawking's paradox might be evaded. Um, this pad I won't want to try to describe. I won't try to describe this uh, uh, in any detail, but just to say that you know, as I said, all these, all of these paradoxes make assumptions. One of the assumptions is that the laws, the equations you work with, have a certain locality. And uh, Kiriakos and Suvrat observed that within the ADS-AFT correspondence of string theory, um, there's a, a certain fundamental breakdown in this locality which occurs in precisely the way that would be needed in, in, in order to evade, e evade Hawking's paradox. So they haven't understood in detail how this happens. They haven't understood in detail how the information about what state went in to make up the black hole is recorded in the Hawking radiation. But that's the eventual picture. The eventual picture is that we believe string theory is telling us that the Hawking radiation carries the information of the black hole and signals a breakdown in the locality in certain fundamental, in, in the fundamental equations of gravity in a very interesting and yet to be completely understood way. Now let's believe that this is correct. If this is correct, then Hawking's information paradox holds within it deep lessons about the fundamental quantum description of gravity, of space and time. And it may be that the fact that black holes preserve information is proof Interesting stuff. The space-time is emergent. Yeah, I won't try to describe in detail. The space-time emerges outside a, out of a non-space-time description. Uh, okay, unless there are questions, I will try to detail. What I want to say is that Hawking's information paradox is an interesting paradox, which probably has interesting impl implications for the fundamental formulation of quantum gravity. Forty years after his formulation of this paradox is the subject of active research and holds potential promise. I mean, the person who cle his completely cleans this up in a completely satisfactory quantitative way will become famous, perhaps become the next Einstein, and uh, uh, may, may, may understand deep lessons about the nature of quantum gravity, which we still don't understand very well. Okay, sorry, sorry for the vagueness of the, at the end, but let's stop. You know, the last part of the talk was not understandable, I understand. Okay? Uh, so try to forget that. Ask questions about the first part, which is probably more. And there's no such thing as a bad question, unless it's a terrible question. Okay. <laughs> about the first part. So you, say, you said that when two black holes collide, they yes. radiate gravitational waves. Yes. When do they radiate in the gravitational waves or as electromagnetic? Uh, how do you know where, how would it, how would you distinguish this? How, how would we distinguish? Yes. You see, collisions of black holes, um, something I should emphasize is this. You see, collisions of black holes are incredibly simple events. Because the black hole solutions, the initial black hole solutions are just simple solutions of general relativity. And in order to understand what this collision is doing, all you have to do is to solve the well understood equations of general relativity with well understood initial conditions. So it's in principle completely algorithmic stuff. Now, if your black holes initially are uncharged, then they are solutions of just general relativity with no matter. And the final evolution will give you rise to some solution of general relativity with no matter. With, with no matter at all. In particular, no charge. Okay? And therefore, can only be in vibrations of the matrix. There's just no room for anything else. On the other hand, ha were the black holes to be charged black holes, okay, then these are solutions of general relativity coupled to Maxwell. 
and then the collisions would give rise to roughly equal amounts of uh, gravity and photons. However, it is believed that astrophysically there are basically no charge vector. Roughly speaking, because if there was charge, you know, it would ionize the medium around it and neutralize it. For the same reason that there are no charge planets, roughly speaking. So, realistically, in an astrophysical situation, um, the only way in which you could really emit um, significant um, radiation through black hole, uh, electromagnetic radiation through black hole collision is by secondary effects. Let's say there's a charged plasma around the black hole. Um, the, this could excite that plasma, which could then secondarily emit. Primarily, almost all the energy becomes gravity. Uh, uh, let's distinguish this from collisions of two neutron stars. If you have two neutron stars colliding, okay, then there will be significant amount of both gravitational as well as electromagnetic radiation. And this, by the way, is in topical because about six months ago, LIGO announced that they saw an event which they thought was a collision of two neutron stars. Quite remarkably, they found it fast enough so that optical optical instruments could go and and zero in on that. So now we have this so-called multi-messenger event, which has been seen in LIGO and has also been seen optically, Confirm. confirming a, everything that they, they feel. This cannot be done with black holes as far as we are. But with neutron stars as well. Okay, this okay. is a question. After. Please. Let me ask it. Okay, you start. Of gravitational waves of the same forms are that of electromagnetic waves. Identical. Doppler shifts are basically kinematic in effect. You know, you've got a wave, how it gets stretched out or not, depending on what frame of reference you have. What makes up that wave as long as it moves at the speed of light? No difference. Just identical. Okay, can you ask? Uh, this is about the second part of your talk. Yes. Um, uh, you mentioned that the en when you introduced entropy, yes. you said this is introduced for a system which is complicated enough. Yes. And that, of course, we understand in, th in terms of chaos and ergodicity and all that. Yes. So when you introduce this concept of entropy for black holes in yes. the picture of string theory, whatever. Yes. So is there any indication that black hole system is also ergodic and chaotic? Okay, uh, it's an excellent question. So the first thing I want to say is that the complicated enough. Yeah, has to do with chaos and ergodicity. In fact, the answer is yes, but let me say many things. One aspect of the complicated enough is that there should be many moving parts in the system. Okay? There should be a parameter in the system such that when taken to infinity, the probability of entropy decreasing goes to zero. Now, in familiar systems, that parameter could be taken to be Avogadro. If you've made a, you've got a stuff made up of a certain number of molecules, as that number of molecules goes to infinity, the probability of entropy decreasing goes to zero. Okay? Now you could ask, is there a, a parameter in, in the black hole situation? Now, even if though we, even without understanding the detailed structure of what makes up the black hole entropy, we can answer this question by just looking at the formula for this. The entropy has something divided by h bar. So the limit h bar goes to zero, takes the number of moving parts to infinity. That's the limit in which the area increase theorem, the, uh, the entropy increase theorem should. Okay, so that's part of the, the point of being complicated enough in the sense of black holes. This is the H bar. However, there is a deeper answer to your question. There is a good reason to believe that black hole motion is essentially ergodic and, in fact, essentially maximally ergodic. Let me explain this. Um, Let's not look at the actual reaching of chaos. But let's look at the approach to chaos. As you know very well, the approach to chaos happens through exponential dependence on initial conditions uh, through the so-called Lyapunov index. Right? You take two initial conditions that are separated by a distance delta x, and after time t, they're separated by delta x times e to the power a times t. Within classical physics, there is no known lower or upper bound on this quantity a. It could be anything. However, there has been a recently proved theorem about, uh, you can define a similar thing in, quanti in the quantum theory. I would have to tell you how, but you can define a similar thing. And there's been theorem proved that in any quantum system, this A quantity cannot exceed 2 pi times the temperature divided by H. Let me write it. 
Or maybe I've got the two-pi wrong. I've, the two-pi could be up or down. I may not be remembering that right. But so e to the power times time, this is the maximal possible divergence, speed of divergence of any two things. Is this from ADSCFT or something? See, <laughs> evidence first came from ADSCFT, but the proof is a proof in quantum mechanics. Okay, this was proved by Malvasena, Schenker, and Stanford. Okay, so simple proof uses causality. The input is causality. Okay, now you can show that within ADSCFT, yeah, ADSCFT describes the correlation functions of a dual quantum field theory. And you can compute the correlation functions that define this quantity in ADSCFT at a given temperature. When you compute at a given temperature, that, that computation is dominated by the behavior of gravity in the presence of a black hole. And uh, so you can do that calculation gravitationally, and you find that this, va this value there is saturated. That this maximum possible value is, in fact, that's of course how it, you saw by doing many different calculations that you always got this number. And then you came up with this proof that this was an upper. Okay, so there is a sense in which motions determine the microscopic motion. See, the classical motion of black holes is just dissipation. It's like hydrodynamics. It's the water molecules that are moving chaotically. So you need ADSAFT to probe this microscopic motion. And when you do that, you find not only is it chaotic, it's maximally chaotic. Note that as h bar goes to zero, this upper bound goes to infinity, consistent with the statement that there's no no bound in classical. Please. At the initial part of your talk, you said, I mean, the black hole as a pure space-time geometry. Yes. What is the sense of time there? Does it have an arrow at that point? That's a very good question. Um, well, you see, at any given time, in the structure of general relativity goes as follows. Every space-time is a Lorentzian manifold. What does this mean? Let's remind ourselves what it means for something to be a Euclidean manifold. A Euclidean manifold in mathematics is a space such that any little bit of it, technically a neighborhood, is isomorphic to a little bit, technically a neighborhood, of Rd. So d-dimensional manifold is something such that it could be curving around. Let's say a two-dimensional manifold. So let's say a, this object here is some two-dimensional manifold that could be curving around in some strange way. But if I take a little region of it, it's identical to a little region of a plane map. It's a little region of R2. Okay? The notion of ge in general relativity, space times are space times in which you have a four-dimensional space time such that any little region of it is identical to a small region of Minkowski space. Okay? Now, Minkowski space comes with Minkowski space, as anyone who studied special relativity, and I know all of you are experts in special relativity, uh, you know that Minkowski space, co space comes with a light cone. Okay, if this is time and this is space, the space is three dimensional, there's a light cone. There's a light cone structure that is all important for the study of causality. An observer can move uh, like this, but he cannot move like this. Okay? So, in any little neighborhood of our space time manifold, there is a little light cone. And these light cones get sewn together to make the global light. Now, what happens in a black hole is this. Suppose we've got the event horizon here. The light cones, which are like this, so as we go nearer and nearer, the event horizon starts tipping over. And at some point, the light cone on the event horizon becomes like this. Okay? And when you go into the event horizon, it becomes like this. Now, what is the rule of physics? The rule of physics is that observers can only move towards the future in your light cone. So here, the rule of physics is that observers can only move into the, in the light cone and towards the future. This is something we're all doing. Locally, the rules of physics always stay the same. Everything interesting in general relativity is not happening locally. Locally, everything is like a little, little bit of Minkowski space. So it's the sewing up. Because of this tipping up, the local rule remains that observers can only move like this. And you see that this has translated into the most the statement that things can only move towards the center of the black hole and not away. So the same rule that outside tells you you can't move backwards in time. Because the light cones have tipped over, tell you you can't move outside in time. 
uh, you know, so it's the same local rule that is brought, that is constructed out of the sewing together of these local lights. At least one question from a student. This is you guys are the guys for whom this talk is. I know there were some from the talk, but or you can ask me after. Anybody from the student that side? Sora, one more. <laughs> okay. Uh, if not, let's uh, uh, thank Shiraz once more. <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, start the. We're running a little late, so we'll start the program at 11:45. Yeah, and there's uh, tea outside, so please uh, uh, have tea outside and come back at uh, 11.45 for the later part of it.